know why? It's because I advertised this lesson on Instagram, so I tempted the fates. We will talk about that in a sec. Right, I am going to quite rudely just point you at this holding screen for less than a minute because people watching on catch up get really cross if I don't because they can't see what they need to bring and things like that. So here we go. I'm just going to rudely flip you. There you go. I have got a question set up for you though actually, although some of you on Facebook yesterday were making very quick work of it. There's just a sentence here, but there's, there's no actual words. So the first word is C-N-A, and then it's Y-U, and then it's R-A-E-D, and then 7-H-1-S. Have a go at question one. That's what you need to bring if you haven't got it yet. I'm just going to quickly shuffle around in the background getting the things myself, and then we will get started. Right, got my candle, got my water, got my matches. Blend it, right, what is it? Making sure I didn't have any cereal on my face. It doesn't matter if I've got cereal on my face on the Facebook lessons because they get deleted, but this is staying on the internet forever. Right, flipping you out. Oh, look, as usual, there's more people showed up, so my faffing has been rewarded. Okay, let's get started. Do, do, do. Do, 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 do. Hello everybody! So if you're new, I usually say Hello Science Alliance! Because I have been streaming free all ages science lessons to home educators for four years. But this is a Shakespeare lesson because you found out that I've got a first class drama degree and my mum was an English teacher for 40 years. So I'm quite connected to the world of English teaching and you asked if I would do some lessons. And I am really enjoying this first one. So welcome, we, I am Lara. This is Theatre of Science, is my company name. And we're going to do an introduction to Shakespeare lesson. We're starting off, right, uh, by doing an, a different, incredibly well-crafted uh, piece of literary analysis, Jurassic Park, because it's my favourite film and it's actually got quite a lot in common with Shakespeare. So people nowadays, they tend to think of Shakespeare as being like sort of very posh and for, for posh people and you have to have been to university to understand it. But Shakespeare was a playwright and a poet, living the end of the 1500s, beginning of the 1600s. Um, crowds in that time, like audiences, were, were very rowdy and chatty and they were snacking and you needed to get their attention. So there's actually a lot of gore in Shakespeare plays. Uh, there's a lot of bum jokes. There's a lot of rude humour and um, it's, it's quite multi-leveled. So... I think, I think it's quite similar to Jurassic Park in a lot of ways. He was incredibly popular with very rich people, but he was also incredibly popular with very poor people. I found this out when I was researching Guy Fawkes for my support magazine. Um, you know how like these days we quote our favorite films to each other in conversation. There's a letter from one of the gunpowder plotters, like Guy Fawkes' mate basically, to another gunpowder plotter. And in it, we're pretty sure that he quotes Shakespeare because Shakespeare was sort of coming up with this language that was very cool in those times. So people were quoting it to each other. So he's very much, you know, Shakespeare plays, I think uh, Jurassic Park is quite a good comparison. So first of all, uh, I'm gonna just look at this tiny little clip of Jurassic Park 
and I want us to kind of pick it apart and that'll give us a little bit of a warm up for when we pick apart Shakespeare. So <clears throat> obviously I can't actually show you the clip from Jurassic Park because copyright reasons but I have redrawn this, it's less than two minutes this scene from Jurassic Park so well that you will not notice the difference. Are you ready? Here we go. Flippy flip. <clears throat> so uh, this is very early on in the film. We've got a character called Ellie, a character called Alan, and they're looking at something on this computer screen here. It's a, a picture of a, a dinosaur, but it's a very fuzzy picture of like a dinosaur that they found under the ground. So Ellie's first line is, oh, PowerPoint. Oh, on Facebook yesterday, I was just stabbing this button, stabbing it down and then stabbing it up and it went horribly wrong, but I'm sure that's not gonna happen today. Ellie says, post-mortem contraction of the posterior neck ligaments, Velociraptor. And Alan says, yes, it is going to happen today. I've got too many tabs open and my computer's really angry with me. And you know what? That's fair enough, computer. You are right to be angry. <sighs> oh, there's nothing I can do about it now. Alan says, yes. Is that... And then this voice from the back of the crowd says, that doesn't look very scary, more like a six foot turkey. And the crowd parts to reveal this boy, this annoying child. How did he see the screen because he was at the back of a crowd? It doesn't matter, shush, we don't care. We're focusing on the dinosaurs, all right, people? Um, so Alan says, a turkey, huh? And Ellie says, oh no, here we go again. So Alan goes over to the child and says, Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. You get, a you get your first look at this six foot turkey as you enter a clearing. He moves like a bird, lightly bobbing his head. And you keep still because you think maybe his visual acuity is based on movement, like a T-Rex. He'll lose you if you don't move. Not Velociraptor. You stare at him and he stares right back. And that's when the attack comes, not from the front, but from the side, from the other two raptors you didn't even know were there. And then Alan gets out this little fossilized raptor claw that he carries everywhere with him in his pocket. He slashes at you with this six inch retractable claw, like a razor. He slashes you here and he mimes slashing open this small boy's stomach or here. Okay, and that, that's the end of the scene. <laughs> Uh, that will do. I've sort of had to cut it a little bit. So what I want you to think about, I'm going to show you all those words on the page. And I want you to think about what does this, it's fairly short, like I say, it's less than two minutes. What information has that little passage given you about dinosaurs? What do you know about dinosaurs? Uh, what does it tell you about Ellie? What does it tell you about Alan? What does it tell you about the relationship between Ellie and Alan? Maybe their relationship to dinosaurs, maybe their, their relationship to children any information that you get from the scene. If you've been to my website, my relatively new website, you have maybe got this printed off in front of you and you can scribble on it. If not, you can just look at the screen. Obviously, that's fine. There's no secret information on the printouts. Right, I need, I have some business cards here that I'm propping up on that have the wrong address on them. I could just do with a couple more business cards. Good enough. I'll use this piece of Lego. There, nailed it. So here we go. What does this scene tell you about dinosaurs, Ellie Allen, anything you like? Post-mortem contraction of the posterior neck ligaments, Velociraptor. Yes, that doesn't look very scary. More like a six foot turkey. Ha ha ha. Crowd of people laugh. A turkey, huh? Oh no, here we go. Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. You get a look at your, you get your first look at this six foot turkey as you enter a clearing. He moves like a bird, lightly barbing his head. And you keep still because you think maybe his visual acuity is based on movement like a T-Rex. He'll lose you if you don't move. Not Velociraptor. I'm in the background. If you've seen the film, I am doing the actions. You stare at him and he stares right back. And that's when the attack comes. Not from the front, but from the sides. From the other two raptors you didn't even know were there. He slashes at you with this. Six inch retractable claw. Like a razor. He slashes you here or here. I'm going to actually be silent <laughs> for, I don't know, one minute. Get as much as you can out of this scene.
So I'm going to ask you some questions in a sec and see if you can answer them using this scene as well. Um, as usual, there is a Facebook post at the moment on my Facebook page right at the top saying, if you're watching live, you can say hello in the comments. So feel free to go over to my Facebook page if you're burning with something that you have to tell me. It's English lessons probably even more than science lessons. Oh, it, like The comments on Facebook lesson yesterday were incredibly useful. All right, are you ready for some questions then? So, how much do you think Ellie knows about dinosaurs? Do we find out how much Ellie knows about dinosaurs in this scene? Is she an amateur? Is she an expert? So she hasn't got many lines in this little bit we're looking at, has she? But they're actually, they're in incredibly insightful. So this whole post-mortem contraction of the posterior neck ligaments bit, it's really complicated scientific language, isn't it? Um, which tells us that she knows a lot, but also the fact that she's just saying this sort of very casually in conversation and she knows that Alan will understand her shows us that she knows a lot and he knows a lot and that they're quite used to working together. How well does Ellie know Alan? Did you get that? How well does Ellie know Alan? So people were doing really well on Facebook and picking up on this. It's only three words, but that tells us so much, doesn't it? He says, a turkey hut, and she just goes, here we go. And straight away, you know, she knows him really well. We, we know, that tells us so much. We know that Alan has done this speech a lot, which tells us a lot about him and how passionate he is. Uh, but it also tells us that they must be very close because she has heard this a lot. Also, she, she obviously puts up with it. <laughs> so that tells us something about their relationship and how close they are. Is Alan kind and patient with children? If you've seen Jurassic Park, right, you, I have to say, you, you might well not want to watch Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park is really scary, as this film hints at. So don't take this that I'm saying you should watch Jurassic Park. It's a 12, it's scary. Uh, but if you have watched Jurassic Park, you know this already. How does Alan feel about children? Is he kind and patient with them? Uh, no, look at this language. This is a child who doesn't know much about dinosaurs and Alan is going, oh, he slashes at you and like pretending to slash him across the stomach. We have instantly established that Alan is not very good with children. How does the script tell us that velociraptors are scary? How do you know? There's loads of different ways here. Go on, have a look at for some words. How do you know velociraptors are scary? Because especially like this was the 90s, right? When I first watched this and most people hadn't even heard of a velociraptor. If you really love velociraptors now, that's like, quite possibly because Jurassic Park taught us all that, Jurassic, that, that raptors are awesome. Have you got some? There's lots of different ways that things can be scary out there. So I've got, the first thing I've got is he stares right back. So you stare at them, he stares right back. So velociraptors are brave, they're not scared of humans. That's when the attack comes. I thought that was quite an interesting word. Like, obviously this is an animal. It's hunting for its food, you know. So you could say, like, you don't say that a lion attacks a hyena, do you? You could say that it was hunting or it's catching its food. But no, like, the word attack makes it sound like they're kind of doing it on purpose just for evil, you know. Um, you didn't even know we're there. So we've established that you, the raptors are very intelligent um, and they've got claws like razors. So just this one paragraph, we know that velociraptors are brave. They will attack humans. They're smarter than us and they're armed with razors. I mean, who is turning this film off after that? If a T-Rex is hunting you, my next question, how do you escape? Obviously, we all know this already. We're all prepared now for a T-Rex attack. But if a T-Rex was hunting you, how do you escape? Uh, we all learned it here. It's not true, by the way. It's not, not good science. But uh, we find out very early on in Jurassic Park that T-Rex will lose you if you don't move, if you stay still. Uh, and finally, OK, it's not information, but how does this bit get you excited about the film? How does it build suspense? And again, there's quite a few different clever ways, I think, that this tiny little bit gets you really excited to watch the rest of the film. Got 15 seconds. Find as many bits as you can. Just got a coffee supporter, that's nice. 
yeah, if you're bored, you can always like or subscribe or shout to your adult, hey, this is brilliant, you should totally be sending Lara five pounds a month. Um, yeah, well, this is my favourite thing about Jurassic Park, is the way that it builds suspense. So, look at this language here. Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. You get your first look at the six-foot turkey. You keep still. He's talking to us, isn't he? Like, if you hear the sentence, try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period, you do try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. So rather than just showing us a velociraptor straight away, we're getting asked to use our imagination. We've got this beautiful visual description, moves like a bird, lightly bobbing his head. I feel like they're really teasing the audience here. It really makes you want to see a velociraptor. It's, this is a film about dinosaurs. We haven't seen a dinosaur yet. And then it builds up ever so slightly, like he gets a claw out. So now you've seen just this single claw, but you still haven't seen the dinosaur. It's incredibly good at building tension, is Jurassic Park. Um, some people who have seen the film will know that later on in the film, we'll, we'll meet a hunter who isn't scared of Velociraptor. And we know that he's making a terrible mistake. And this really feeds into how exciting the scene is because he's just like, oh, it's okay, I've got this. And we're all dinosaur experts now. Because of this scene, we're all like, no, dude, no, you haven't got this. Ah. <laughs> so just to recap, we will move on to Shakespeare now. <laughs> but just to recap, this is a less than two minute exchange and it has taught us Ellie and Alan are very close. Alan doesn't like kids. Ellie's more tolerant of kids. T-Rex can't see you if you don't move. Raptors are terrifying. And this scene also quite cleverly ranks the dinosaurs, doesn't it? We know that T-Rex is scary, but we know that raptors are scarier. There is a way to escape T-Rex. There isn't a way to escape a raptor that we know of. We know how raptors move. We know that Ellie and Alan are experienced scientists. We know how to feel when we see the dinosaurs later. And we know there is going to be some serious, gory, slashy stuff with razors in this film. Um, and this is why I genuinely think that Jurassic, well, uh, Jurassic Park is my favourite film because I c you can watch it once and then you can watch it again and again and see different things that the director and the writer have done. And this is why people are still watching Shakespeare plays 400 years later because there is so, it's very, very well crafted. You can watch a Shakespeare play and go, <laughs> he said whole, but he actually meant the guy's bum. And that is a perfectly good way to watch Shakespeare plays. But you can also watch the same scene and go, Oh my goodness, I think that my life might be completely meaningless. Um, and this, this is why people love Shakespeare, but there's no right or wrong way to watch it, as we will hopefully find out. Okay, um, I am a theatre of science, so let's do a tiny little bit of science as well and talk about Shakespeare and science. If you have a candle with you, can you please light it now? I'm going to light it by holding it up, because good telly, but you could just keep it on the ground, please. Um, also, because it's YouTube, and this is staying on the internet, I'm going to use an orange candle as well. I know, you guys get all the best stuff. Um, and yeah, I'd like you to have a bowl of warm water and a bowl of cold water. What we're going to do is just let that candle pull. I've got two because I need to be fast, but um, you can just have one. Just let it burn and you need a little pool of wax to gather. Um, and I'm, I'm going to tell you about science in Shakespeare's time using this timeline. At the moment, it's just a line, but we will and embellish the line. Here we go. So, very early 1500s, uh, everyone thought that Earth was at the very centre of the universe and that, uh, sorry, I've just, I've just, my candle's just gone out, so I'm a bit distracted. Everyone thought Earth was at the very centre of the universe and that everything span around Earth. So the idea was God had created the Earth God had created humans, which are the most important things to God. And everything else is just like all the universe and the stars and everything are just there for humans pleasure. OK, um, and then a chap called Copernicus comes along. Uh, I, I put too much spice on this candle in previous lessons. That's why. And Copernicus says, uh, do you know what, guys? Like, I've been actually making observations and I think maybe the Earth goes round the sun. What an enormous thing to tell people. Absolutely huge. So that was 1543. Um, in 1556, an English textbook mentions this idea for the first time. And in 1564, Shakespeare is born. So we've, we've got to think that people are discussing this idea, right? As Shakespeare is, is growing up and going to school. Um, 1590, the microscope is invented. In 1595, Shakespeare writes a play called A Midsummer Night's Dream, which we will study. Uh, 1606, he writes a play called Macbeth, which we will also study. 
1608, the telescope is invented. 1611, Shakespeare writes The Tempest. In 1620, someone called Francis Bacon, um, this is incredibly oversimplified, but he, he kind of invents science. He suggests, hey, maybe we should be testing things and investigating them instead of just talking about them to try and work things out. So um, Shakespeare... Shakespeare was living in this time that we now look back on and call the scientific revolution in Europe. There was loads of scientific thinking going on, incredible things being discovered. And it's really interesting because Shakespeare just doesn't mention it at all. And there's lots of scientific bloggers kind of trying to find connection. I don't think he mentions it, guys. So I read a, a blog with uh, someone saying, like, on his gravestone, it's actually quite a a sort of serious lecture on uh, his mum's gravestone it says something like uh, we hope that she she can look at the stars it's like oh maybe she was really into astronomy and she taught Shakespeare's job if you look at his plays he is far more about superstition and fortune telling and magic and otherworldliness and um, so that's what our activity is going to be about I should say he doesn't get to find out about this Francis Bacon stuff sadly because he dies in 1616 so I don't know like maybe it just hadn't hit his radar who knows but but it, we're not going to talk a lot about science I'm going to cram in as much as I can as the lessons go by but this activity actually is about fortune telling because in times gone by, um, they used to use metal, actually, or candle wax. We're obviously going to use wax. They used to melt it down so it was a liquid. I'm doing this because the particles in a liquid are all moving around each other, kind of like a ball pool. Um, they've got quite a lot of energy. And when particles in a liquid cool down, they slow down and they get bonded together firmly enough that they turn into a solid, right? They can't move. So the idea is you pour wax into cold water and the shape that the wax takes on tells your fortune. I know, right? So we're going to do that. You're supposed to pour it into cold water. Um, but I think, actually, if you pour it into warm water, because the part of the hot wax, um, if you pour it into warm water, that doesn't take as much energy away from the particles as quickly. It gives it a little bit longer to cool down. You get a more interesting shape, which is why I've said let's do it with both, warm water and cold water. Um, oh, this beautiful orange candle is not wanting to give me any wax at all so sad but I'll pour my white one into my cold water if you're not doing this at home that's quite good for me because you can have a look at mine and try and tell me my fortune I was getting some excellent suggestions on uh, Facebook yesterday okay so we've got loads of wax in here this is good be careful not to burn yourself like I did in the first lesson make sure you hold it from below if you're doing this yourself just get an adult to do it for you and tip it in yeah this is my cold water so that's what I'll start with you ready Mm, maybe it's cheating. I'm going to just splosh some cold water on it so you can see that the particles on the top are still liquid. Wow. Come on. What does that tell you? Ooh. I don't want to give you... Wow. Oh, my goodness. Oh, the YouTube lesson's just always the best. I don't want to give you any ideas because maybe you're doing this yourself or maybe um, you're looking at mine. If you're looking at mine... Can you please, well, and if you're looking at yours, can you have a look at your wax shape and have a go at predicting your fortune? What do you reckon that your little wax shape is telling you about your future? And question number two, did that exercise teach you anything about yourself? Yeah, that could just be a yes or no answer, or you could write down if, if yes, what you think it did teach you about yourself. What I've learned is I shouldn't pour spice and salt onto my candles because then I can't use them again. Look at this, sad times. But I'm gonna do the warm water one now using this candle, what I prepared earlier, okay. Hmm. Actually, wasn't as good. Well, who am I to say? Who am I to say? Oh, oh my days, no, wait, look at this shape. Oh, guys. Oh no broken broken that off what oh my goodness I feel like my future is so clear so you be doing this yourself <laughs> tell your fortune with your wax did that exercise teach you anything about yourself and if you're not doing it you can look at mine
Have you done that? All right, so I'm delighted because I didn't want to influence you, but clearly I'm winning a car, aren't I, in a competition? That is obviously what's happening to, to me. That is uncanny. Um, and I'm getting a pet squirrel as well in my life, I think. Or maybe maybe playing the, the game Space... Is it Space Invaders? Space Raiders, I think. Um, so, obviously, you know, I'm a science teacher. Oh, no! Oh, I'm going to be in a terrible car accident. No, it's okay. Woo, saved it. Saved my future. Um, obviously, I don't think I'm going to be offending everyone if I tell you that there is no scientific reason why dropping wax into a bowl of water will tell your fortune, right? The wax doesn't know what's going to happen to you. But the reason that I didn't... Uh, try and say my fortune out loud before you'd had a chance is because actually this activity I feel it definitely can tell you something about yourself right like this kind of looks like a handbag but I wasn't gonna say oh wow I think I'm gonna get to go on an amazing shopping trip because like I'm not really interested in shopping I mean I'm not that interested in cars but you know what I mean like I wasn't ever gonna see golf in my future because I don't know anything about golf and I don't care about it whereas I quite like squirrels so instantly I thought that this looked like a squirrel so a lot of people well, not a lot of people, but some people, some of my science alliance were like, oh, English lessons, like there's no right or wrong answer. And, you know, it's not very concrete. Looking at how Shakespeare talks about magic and uh, well, uh, black magic and witches and all this kind of stuff, it can definitely teach us something about history. It can teach us a lot about what audiences at the time in the 15 and 1600s uh, believed, attitudes to women, which we will go into in later lessons. Uh, it can certainly tell us a lot about history and also tell us quite a lot about about humanity as well. Um, Shakespeare had something in common with us. If you remember when Queen Elizabeth quite recently died and King Charles came on the throne, the same thing happened to Shakespeare. Queen Elizabeth was a huge fan of Shakespeare, the, the first Queen Elizabeth, and then she died and King James came on the throne. King James was really into magic. He wrote a book called Demonology, which was all about, basically, here it is, Demonology. Uh, written by the high and mighty Prince James, by the grace of God of England, Scotland, France and Ireland, defender of the faith. Yeah, um, it was all about like black magic, how to defeat it, how to hunt witches. Obviously, when he said witches, he meant women. Really quite unpleasant stuff. Uh, but, but yes, we will look at this, how Shakespeare was writing at a time when even the king absolutely definitely believed in, in magic and the forces of good and evil. All right, so before the end of the lesson, I want to look at some actual Shakespeare and teach you the difference between verse and prose and some of the different ways that Shakespeare used to write. Um, a very quick note, when I showed you this scene at the beginning of Jurassic Park and Ellie said, postmodern contraction of the posterior neck ligaments, velociraptor, did you get really freaked out and think, oh no, that's really complicated language, I don't understand it, I think Jurassic Park must be too hard for me. Did you think, oh no, I'm going to turn this off because I don't get it. No, you didn't, did you? Because you understood that the reason the writer had put that in there was to show us that Ellie is a really good scientist. You understood that really you were just supposed to hear blah, blah, hard science, blah, blah, and that teaches us about her character. Maybe in 500 years time, people will be watching Jurassic Park going, oh my God, people 500 years ago were so clever, they understood this, I don't understand this, it just means I'm stupid, I don't wanna watch it anymore. And that would be foolish, wouldn't it? That would not be correct. What I'm obviously trying to say is, in Shakespeare's day, None of the audience watching Shakespeare play would have understood all of the words that were happening, but they would have been more comfortable with the fact that they didn't understand, if you know what I mean. So don't worry, definitely don't worry if you don't understand all the words that we are seeing today or that you hear in Shakespeare plays. Also, a lot of you on Facebook were doing very well with this sentence. It's weird, isn't it? You can tell, really. This says, can you read this? Really? What does it say? And is it easy to read or very difficult? Our brain is amazing. Our brain will just help us to pick out the information that we do understand and uh, and kind of work out the rest on its own. So the main thing with Shakespeare is to just not panic if there's loads of words that you don't get. Just pick out the words that you do get. And hopefully, especially with a little bit of reading and lessons like this, it will start to come together. I, I definitely don't understand all of the Shakespeare that I read. I think the difference is when you're a bit older and you've studied it, you feel more comfortable. Like if I'm acting in a Shakespeare play, I could just go, sorry, director, I just don't get it. What is this? What am I saying? And then they tell you and it's fine. Right, there are two different styles of writing in Shakespeare plays. They are prose and verse. Prose is what I, as a trained science teacher, I'm going to call just chatting. 
Yeah, there's no set rhythm to pray. It's just like, it's just normal chatting, right? It's just, just words. Verse has a rhythm. It looks like a poem on the page. Usually, not nowadays, but usually each line in Shakespeare, if he's writing in verse, each line starts with a capital letter, all right? Prose is just chatting. It's just, it's just normal, isn't it? Verse, it has a rhythm, it looks like a poem, maybe it's got a certain structure, and, and usually each line starts with a capital letter. Are you ready? Let's do this. So is this prose, please? No rhythm, just chatting? Or is it verse? Rhythm looks like a poem. So this is a very famous thing that the witches say in uh, Macbeth, which we will learn about next week. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble, fill it of a fenny snake in the cauldron, boil and bake. Is that prose? Just shine. Or is it first? Got a rhythm, looks like a poem. Five, four, three. Go on, commit, make a decision. What do you think? It's... You see, we've got capital letters at the start of each line. If you if you like grammar, you'll have noticed that state, snake has a comma after it, uh, but in starts with a capital letter. So that was a clue that it was verse. Also, obviously, it rhymes, doesn't it? Um, verse can rhyme, but verse doesn't have to rhyme. But yes, this was in verse. What about this one? Uh, Rosalind, the female character that Shakespeare wrote the most lines for in As You Like It. This is Rosalind saying... Dear Celia, I show more mirth than I am mistress of, and would you yet I were merrier? Unless you could teach me to forget a banished father, you must not learn me how to remember any extraordinary pleasure. Is that prose, just chatting? Or is it verse? Has a rhythm, looks like a poem, capital letters, etc, etc. It's, uh, it's prose, that one, it's prose. So it's just, we can see, there's no capital letters at the start. Uh, we'll look at rhythm in a second, but yeah, there isn't any kind of set rhythm to this. Um, note as well, when you're reading Shakespeare, you don't stop at the end of a line, right? You, you follow the punctuation. So this is not, dear Celia, I show more mirth than I am. <gasps> Mistress of, and would you yet I were? <gasps> Maria, it, it runs over the lines, yeah? Uh, what about this one? Prose? No rhythm, just chatting. Or this? Rhythm. Uh, this is in Midsummer Night's Dream, which we will also have a look at. This is Bottom. So Quince is putting on a play. He's cast Bottom in his play. And Bottom says, Oh, let me play the lion too. I will roar that I will do any man's heart good to hear me. I will roar that I will make the Duke say, Let him roar again. Let him roar again. And Quint says, and you should do it too terribly. You would fright the Duchess and the ladies that they would shriek. And that were enough to hang us all. And Bottom says, oh, but I will aggravate my voice. So I will roar you as gently as any sucking dove. I will roar you to any nightingale. I'm, re I'm really loving, can you tell I'm really loving getting to read all this out? Uh, it is prose. Yeah, it's prose. There's no capital letters there rather. There's, there's no set rhythm. That was prose. What about this one? This is a classic, isn't it? Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, no more, and by a sleep to say we end. I hope there's no one watching this who's actually ever played Hamlet. Is that prose? Just chatting? Or is it rhythm? Uh, verse. Is... Look, suffer is at the end of a line with no full stop, but the the on the next line is capital letter. And uh, that is, you might have been able to sense it with them there. We will talk about that in a sec, but that was verse, yeah. And the last one then, here's Ariel from The Tempest, which we'll probably study eventually, but not this, this module. All hail, great master. Grave, sir, hail, I come to answer thy best pleasure, be it to fly, to swim, to dive into the fire, to ride on the curled clouds, to thy strong bidding task, Ariel and all his quality. Is that this or is it prose? It's... It's verse, that one. The capital letters were a little clue, uh, but there's another huge clue which we will talk about now. So we'll just look at verse now, okay? 
That was verse versus prose, just chatting. Now we're just going to look at verse. There's a special kind of verse that Shakespeare uses a lot, and it is called <laughs> iambic pentameter. What a great couple of words. So iambic means basically that it goes da dum da dum da dum da dum, and pentameter means um, that it's five lots of two beats. So you might know like a pentagram as five sides. Pentameter means five lots of two beats. Now five lots of two, that is just 10, isn't it? And I usually, I, I used to think, until I researched these lessons, I used to think of iambic pentameter as just meaning it's kind of 10 beats in a sentence. So for example, this one, uh, if I was like, right, that's a bit, can you see that? It looks all weird and flickery, doesn't it? That better. Um, so if I was reading this, I would have gone, um, all hail great master, grave sir, hail I come. Oh yeah, that's 10. To answer thy best pleasure, beat to fly, another 10. Oh yeah, this is iambic pentameter because it's got 10. But actually, because I was researching this lesson, I looked on the Royal Shakespeare Company's website and they've got a video of their sort of speech and language expert doing a, a workshop with some people. And she <coughs> said, that to work out if it's iambic pentameter, you should get your hands together, like put all your fingers together. And she didn't call it the poke and slap method, but that's why I'm calling it. You poke on the first beat and then she sort of patted her heart on the second beat. So that was like, da dum. So poke, da, and then slap is dumb. So you have to do five of those if it's iambic pentameter. So da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. So she would have said, all hail, great master, grave, sir, hail, I come. To answer thy best pleasure, be it to fly. And I was like, oh yeah, that's much better. It is da dum da dum da dum. See, have a go. Can you make those words fit? Have a, have, have a little go at poke and slap. Poke, slap, poke, slap. Can you make that work for you? Um, be a little bit careful. We're looking at rhythm. We're not looking at syllables. So this bit from Romeo and Juliet. But soft what light through yonder window breaks. It is the east and Juliet is the sun. Is that iambic pentameter? What do you reckon? Can you get five poke slaps <laughs> into those lines? I know this is a good question because it divided people on Facebook. I'm always delighted when half of people go, yeah, definitely. And half of people go, no, for sure, no. <laughs> um, it actually is, um, which is where I think the poke and slap method is good. Because if you were just counting syllables, you might, this second line, you might say, it is the East and Juliet is the Sun, and you would get 11 syllables, right? But if you poke and slap, but soft what light through yonder window breaks, it is the East and Juliet is the Sun. It definitely fits into five poke and slaps each line, um, which is why Shakespeare is so great, because he tends to tell you how to say the line as well. So an actor reading this would know, OK, Juliet, I'm going to say that as kind of two syllables, not three. All right, I think you're ready to play. All right, playing, is it? But I'm, I'm going to, it's just a nicer word than test. Oh, by the way, FYI, I read this from a very reliable source, some people, including Charles Dickens, apparently, say that when they're speaking from the heart, their words fall into this iambic pentameter rhythm. So watch, watch out for that. I, I guess if you're speaking from the heart, maybe you're not thinking, oh, it's this iambic pentameter. But there, there you go. That's what I heard. OK, <clears throat> let's look at the verse. This is the last thing we'll, second last thing we'll do. Is it iambic pentameter, please? Is this iambic pentameter? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Is that iambic pentameter? It, <laughs> it it is iambic pentameter, yeah. 
shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. It is, I'm a bit pensive so Let's do the next one. This is Hermia from Midsummer Night's Dream. What about this one? I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I am made bold. Is that iambic pentameter? Does that fit with a poke slap? Um, it. It is iambic pentameter. So again, if you were if you were counting on your fingers like I used to do, I know not by what power I am made bold. He might have got eleven, but if you poke slap it, I know not by what power I am made bold. You could definitely fit that into a uh, five five poke and slaps. Okay, Titania here from a Midsummer Night's Dream. First, rehearse your song by rote. To each word, a warbling note. Hand in hand with fairy grace, we will sing and bless this place. Is that iambic pentameter? This was uh, really foxing people on Facebook yesterday. A lot of people were saying, yes, uh, but it's not actually, it is verse, it's definitely verse, it's not prose, it's not just chatting, uh, but it's in 10 beats, it's, it's not in 10 beats, is it? First rehearse your song by rote, I could only get in three poke and slaps and a half, three poke and slaps and one extra poke, so it's, it's actually uh, seven beats, isn't it? First rehearse your song by rote. To each word a warbling note. So it is verse, but it's not iambic pentameter because it hasn't got the full five da dum da dums in. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, now this was foxing people as well. I was delighted with this on Facebook. Is this iambic pentameter? This is Macbeth that we'll look at next week and uh, his wife <laughs> called Lady Macbeth. Hath he asked for me? And Lady Macbeth says, No, you not, he has. Is that iambic pentameter or not? Yeah, this is mean. This is one of those teacher things where I'm like, I'll teach you it by just having you answer a question on it. This actually um, is iambic pentameter. They're sharing the lines. Oh, just like they share the desire to commit evil, murderous deeds. It's quite, I always, it's quite hard to fit this one. Um, but it is iambic pentameter. I think it's hard because you, you want to say, hath he asked for me? But the it's the second beat that's the dumb, isn't it? If you go, hath he asked for me, you get a bit confused, but it's, hath he asked for me, no you not he has. Hath he asked for me, no you not he has. So it is Iambic Pentameter. Shakespeare uses this quite a lot. It's quite a good way for uh, making a scene really fast, like this kind of fast exchange that they're finishing off each other's ideas. And we'll look actually right at the end in a second um, at, at how that can get get ideas across in Shakespeare. Okay, uh, this is the last one. Iago, good name in man and woman, dear my lord, is the immediate jewel of their souls. Oh, love this bit. Who steals my purse, steals trash. Tis something, nothing, twas mine, tis his, and has been slave to thousands. But he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him. Is that iambic pentameter? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Good name in man and woman. I'm going to have a real bruise. This is the third time I've done this lesson now. I'm going to have to do the other side. Good name in man and woman, dear my lord, is the immediate jewel of their souls. Who steals my purse, steals trash, tis something, nothing. It is, isn't it? It is, but you've got to do a little bit of tweaking, which again, a, an actor would, would realise that immediate and jewel, you've got to sort of squish them together, haven't you? But it is iambic pentameter. Okay.
<clears throat> sticking with Iago, generally speaking, the richer, posher, like in Shakespeare's time, you'd say upper class, higher class characters speak in verse. So the structured one with the rhythm. And the commoners just chat, they speak in prose. But this is not always the case. So just finally, I want to do a tiny little bit of what we did at the start with Jurassic Park, but with Shakespeare. Have a look at this bit from Othello. So Othello's in charge and he's just asked Cassio to keep guard for the night. And Cassio says, Iago hath direction what to do, but notwithstanding, with my personal eye will I look to it. And Othello says, Iago is most honest. Iago hath direction what to do, but notwithstanding, with my personal eye will I look to it. Iago is most honest. Can you, even if you don't really understand it, I mean, it's literally just like two lines, isn't it? So you haven't got the context, but are there any quick comments you can make about their relationship? What do you reckon the relationship might be between Cassio and Othello? It's not enough really is it, to say for sure, but what kind of, what hints do you get from this? So people on Facebook yesterday were using, were saying things like um, maybe they're friends, they, they like each other. And yeah, I agree with that. Um, looking at this, they're finishing each other's iambic pentameter, aren't they? They're, they're sort of sharing it. Well, I look to it, Iago is most honest. You do get the impression from this that they're in agreement. They've got quite a good relationship. Maybe they work well in a team because even their words are sort of working in a team to make iambic pentameter. So yeah, right. Iago, who is probably the most evil backstabbing villain in any Shakespeare play, then persuades Cassio to have some alcohol. And two minutes after speaking like this, Iago hath direction what to do, but notwithstanding, with my personal eye will I look to it. Cassio, after a drink, is speaking like this. Do not think, gentlemen, I am drunk. This is my ancient, this is my right hand, and this is my left. I am not drunk now. I can stand well enough and speak well enough. And the gentlemen say, excellent well. And Cassio says, why, very well then. You must not think that I am drunk. What clues, just uh, to finish the lesson now, what clues do we have here that Cassio is in fact extremely, very actually drunk indeed? There's, there's, there's quite a lot in the words, but there's also some stuff in the structure that you might be able to see uh, after what we've just done. And this is the last thing we'll do. So if you do want to go to my Facebook page, just Data Science on Facebook, the first post, um, if you click into it, it says, it's like four photos, but I've put, if you want to comment here, I'll go and read all those comments out in a minute and see, see what you're saying. Okay, what clues do we have that Cassio is drunk? Well, um, he says he's not drunk. So someone yesterday, I was really pleased they said this, they thought he was saying he is drunk because it says, I am drunk, but... Do not think, gentlemen, I am drunk, means don't be thinking that I'm drunk. Uh, and he repeats this. You must not think that I am drunk. Um, so he's repeating himself, which suggests he's quite confused. Maybe he's forgotten that he said it first, and that's why he's saying it again. It also shows that he's worried about it. It's really on his mind, isn't it? And he's worried about people thinking he's drunk because he knows that he is drunk. Um, his proof that he's okay is a ridiculously simple test, isn't it? This is my right hand and this is my left. And, uh, you know, a good actor or director would probably make it that he got those hands confused as well. But so to be extra funny. Um, my ancient, by the way, is talking about Iago. That's, um, it's a rank like soldier, captain, ancient. That's, he just means Iago there. Um, I like, I like this, that uh, the gentlemen say, oh, okay, yeah, fine, you're not drunk. And he sort of sounds really surprised, like, why? Uh, well, very well then. He, he's surprised that they believe him because I think he's worried that it's just really obvious. And finally, very well done if you spotted, he's speaking in prose, isn't he? He's gone from this lovely structured rhythm, rhythmic language to just chatting, um, which shows us that he's not in control, is he? He's not in control of his words anymore. He's not structuring his words, uh, which is a good clue that he's not in control of himself either. And it's going to lead to terrible, terrible things happening later on because Othello is a, a very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? 
where where there's a lot of there's a lot of I don't know, no spoilers, no spoilers for Othello. It's a fascinating play, love it. Right, uh, that is the end of my introduction to Shakespeare lesson. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh my days, I really enjoyed teaching this. So if you're watching live, we've got two lessons on Macbeth coming up in the next couple of weeks. And then we've got two lessons on a Midsummer Night's Dream and that will wrap up this Shakespeare module. But I think it's going well, it seems popular. So I'll probably end up at some point doing like a couple of lessons on The Tempest and a couple of lessons on Taming of the Shrew or something. And in the end, we'll have a little bank on my uh, website where we kind of build up all the lessons. Uh, I'll go over to my Facebook page now to see if anyone said hello. If, if you are enjoying this lesson, how it works is, because it is quite weird and confusing, everything that I do is free. It's just easier admin wise. So all the lessons that I do are free. If you've gone to my website and printed off the printouts, you will have found that they are also free. I teach IGCSE physics lessons for free. I do a Lego story time show where we do an activity and I tell you about something and we do a little Lego story at the end. So this week, it's actually on at half past 10 today on YouTube uh, and it's all about the Globe Theatre. If you wanna come see that, it's free. And how it works is just, you can pay me if you want. So I've got this website called Coffee uh, where's my pen? Oh, my pens are running out. If you go to my about section on YouTube, or the big blue button on my Facebook page, or you just search Theatre of Science, um, coffee, you get this website called Coffee and you can send me five pounds a month. And yeah, it's just working really well. Uh, if I was you, I would still, after four years, have not got around to supporting me, but bless you, you are doing it, it's so good. So I send you nice things. Um, to say thank you for supporting me um, because I literally couldn't do it without you. I would just not have this job. I'd be teaching in a school if people weren't sending me five pounds a month. So hopefully not too much from you for, from you, uh, for like a, a month's worth of lessons. But because there's so many of you, it builds up and it's enough that it can be my job. So if you sign up to support me, if you, if you go to my bounce section and you click the link to coffee, I will send you some rainbow glasses that make you see rainbows. They're amazing. Uh, and I'll send you Theatre of Science magazine. If you do support me, I'm really sorry, but Theatre of Science magazine is just incredibly late. Oh, wow, 65 comments, amazing. Okay, brilliant. Um, yeah, it just comes out when it comes out. I write it around all the planning and work that I do. Um, but if you sign up now, I will send you a past copy of Theatre of Science magazine to keep you going. So the one that I will send you is about sleep. It's got a comic in it, which my husband illustrates for me, about how maybe we used to not sleep all through the night and that was okay. Uh, it's got choose your own adventure. You've written a novel, will it get turned into a film? Or will you just end up wandering the streets? Uh, it depends on how much you know about sleep. Um, I send you a little packet of organic lavender and some fabric so you can sew yourself a sleep squish, which is proven to help you sleep. Uh, it's got a jigsaw, which is kind of about sleep, uh, Van Gogh uh, painting that I've taught you about. Oh yeah, and it's got a little origami koala in it, a little bookmark because koalas sleep more than any other animal, I find as I was researching this magazine. So thank you very much. If you have Theatre of Science magazine, this is it's quite an old past magazine that I've just had reprinted for people who sign up now. Um, but yeah, if, if you have a fit of science magazine in your house, thank you. You are the reason why I can do this. Uh, and it is, well, it's more than appreciated. Obviously, obviously this is the best job ever. Uh, right, let's have a look at these comments then. Ah, oh, thanks, Vicky. Hello. We loved your lesson and Lego story session. Ah, oh, thanks. Wait, you've already seen it. Ah, oh, it's Jay and Daisy and Daniel. Hello. Good to see you. Question one. It does. Well done. <clears throat> Hello, Olivia. Can you read this really? What's to say? Yes. We're on our half term, so we will watch on YouTube. Oh, thanks, guys. I am glad I'm doing this too. Uh, oh, hello, Toby. Hello. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this. I like the YouTube one because I've already taught it twice, so like, I'm a little bit more relaxed and know that it's going to be okay. <laughs> oh, hello, Arthur and Abba and Gemma. Hello. Oh, you've got a new bub. Oh, oh. See, I'm not really a dog person. I'm not a dog person, but... I'm going to show you a picture of this puppy. Man alive, it's wearing a jumper. Look at that. Oh, oh, oh he's so small. Has he got three eyes? Kind of looks like it's got on it. Anyway, like I say, I'm not, I'm not a dog person. I don't know. Maybe there's a new three-eyed dog breed out there. You know what they're like, these dog breeders. <laughs> right, Amelia and Kitty, the cat, are watching. Whoa, 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 it's Amelia's birthday. Whoa, dude, happy birthday. Wow, happy birthday. Oh, and you got the magazine, the rainbow glasses. That's nice. Thank you so much for signing up. That's really lovely. Amelia, happy birthday. Wow, that's so exciting. It's your birthday today and you're watching this. Hello, Robin, <laughs> brackets good fellow. Oh yeah, we will be learning all about uh, goblins uh, in a couple of weeks time. You also really like Jurassic Park films. 
It's bad luck to say Macbeth in theatre. I know. Yes, it is. If you say Macbeth in the theatre, you have to like go outside the theatre and turn around three times and spit and then knock on the door to be let back in. This is only my kitchen, so I'm hoping it's okay, but I am, I'm not feeling 100% comfortable with it, I have to say. Your wax says you will get a pet turtle and a car that has been crushed by Godzilla. <gasps> I have a Godzilla in my future. Oh, hello, Sebastian Humphrey. Uh, <coughs> you think my remake of Jurassic Park was perfect? Yeah, a couple of people have said, please, can you do the whole of Jurassic Park? <laughs> like that. I am getting a new car. <gasps> or a space blaster from Star Wars. Oh, yeah. Hello, Bella. You love Shakespeare? Uh, dad can't come because he's asleep because he did a night shift. Bella's dad is the enemy of the science lines. He never comes and he's always got some really pathetic excuse like, oh, sorry, I was rescuing a cat from a tree or planting a tree or whatever, curing some kind of disease. But, but he also works nights. I just, he's a, he's really is a man of mystery. <laughs> oh, no way, it's an actually... Okay, right, he's actually sent us a message. We've heard from Bella's dad. We've never had a message from, from the man himself. I'm sorry I can't make theatre science tonight. I have to sleep between night shifts. Oh, we need sleep now. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like, I love Bella so hard, but dad is such a loser. Need sleep. Right, oh yeah, it gives you a feel of fear and excitement that that's why Jurassic Park builds tension. Yes, it does, Those, that's exactly what I felt when I watched that scene in 1993. Ooh, we love the chest poke and slap. I know, I know, it wasn't me, obviously, uh, that invented that. Although I did coin poke and slap, which I think actually I should send to the York Shakespeare Company, I think, the, the uh, Royal Shakespeare Company. That'll be good marketing for them. Hello, Imogen and Ophelia. Very, very Shakespearean names. Looking forward to your names are Shakespearean. Yes, they are indeed, uh, you, you know this. Hello, Aurelia, you got the reading at the start. Oh, good. My hot water one thinks, I'll get a trophy or grow a horn. Hmm. Maybe you'll win a trophy for your amazing horn. I don't know. Ah, Bella's mum says I look absolutely beautiful today. I put makeup on because it's week one and this video is staying on YouTube. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> also, I am just a beautiful person, but sometimes I look a little bit like I just dashed out of the shower, uh, threw clothes on and sat down in front of my phone. <laughs> because that's what usually has happened. Hello, Bethany. Catherine says, a lot. You're probably right. I'm sure you're right. A lot, loads. Rosalind speeches prose. Toby, well done. Oh, Lana, can you outrun a T-Rex? Can you? I hear they've been clocked at like 25, 30 miles an hour. So I don't know about that. Uh, the wax said something about an elephant and a duck. And it's going to snow soon. Okay, cool. These are some excellent fortunes. Bethany has thoroughly enjoyed the lesson and her wax looks like a seahorse. No idea what that means. Uh, no, me neither. Maybe nothing. Maybe nothing. Uh, so Shakespeare has a dangling feather earring in his left ear that meant something specific and I can't remember what. Do you know what? No, I don't. But we will do a Lego story show on Shakespeare soon. <gasps> Speaking of Lego story show, I should totally go and set up. I, I kind of need to make a model of Shakespeare's globe before the Lego story show, which is in 27 minutes. Oh, Amber says, hello. She was impressed you were doing Shakespeare after finding out that characters Romeo and Juliet mentioned in a Taylor Swift song were actually invented by Shakespeare. Oh, really? Do you know Taylor Swift has used iambic pentameter a bit as well. If you type Taylor Swift iambic pentameter into the internet, the internet will provide. Your hot water one means you'll find an old teddy bear. Ah, oh, yeah. Oh, it does look like a teddy bear, doesn't it? Yeah. Clues that Cassio is now a bit tiddled. He no longer speaks in that, but paying time to it. Yes, very well, very well spotted. Hello, Noah. All right. Hello, Edmund. He's watching me live. Edmund thinks there is technically no right answer to whether the sun moves around the earth or earth moves around the sun. And that both points of view must be valid because Einstein said there was no such thing as absolute motion. Relative motion is the only kind of movement there is. It's good. It's a good point. Um, yes, that is true. I would see what you mean. So if you're on Earth, then it looks like the sun is moving around Earth. Oh, that's good, Edmund. Oh, if you're on Earth, it appears that the sun is moving around us, doesn't it? Just like if you're sitting on a train, then if the train next to you starts moving, Sometimes you think that you're moving because you can't tell the difference between, yeah, I mean, no, but it's a very interesting point. 
your lessons are always so engaging and fun. We can't thank you enough. I'm a bit embarrassed I read that one out loud. Ooh, the Macbeth Lady Macbeth one is Trixie. If I join them together, then it is. Yes, it is. Well spotted. Hello, Hannah and Sam. Hello. Hello, Olivia. Oh, I've always said those to you loads. Must be a close relationship, Cassio and Othello. Yes, good. The dinosaurs are different. Yes, they are different. Yeah, I really, I love that. I love that by the time you see the dinosaurs, you're just totally equipped to know about them. Now talking in prose. Well done. You've got the grim. Ah, don't tell me that. That's a bad thing, isn't it? I'm not looking at what that means. Hello, Thomas. YouTube only just let us in. That's all right. Oh, yeah. Oh, in fact, that was probably me starting late, which is what you mean. Hamlet's verse, Toby. Yeah, Hamlet's all verse, isn't he? Hello, Charlotte. Interested to know how fortune telling influences your future. Yeah, that's true. That is interesting, actually, how if you think something's going to happen, it is probably far more likely to happen, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot of research that suggests that if we think things are true, we're more, it's more likely to be, you know, if your belief definitely affects, doesn't it? If you think you can do something, you're much more likely to be able to do it than if you think you can't do something. There is no way to escape a T-Rex, as Pentos discovered it was the hearing that was bad. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Just, yeah, you're absolutely right. From kind of health and safety point, if you are ever in a room with a T-Rex, they can see you, even if you don't move. Oh, hello, Suki and Oza and Eunice and Salah and Musa. Hello. Ah, oh, thanks for coming. Ah, oh, it's just a beautiful, I'm not going to read out Carmel's comments. Cause it's lovely, made me feel all weird inside. More comments. God, I've got to go. Right, let's go fast. Immediate. See you at story time. Abba, one of my bags will break. <laughs> and I'll meet a stone talus from Zelda. Ellie says, oh no, here we go again. She means, uh, she knows Alan well, exactly. Yes. You <laughs> Bella says, I refuse to believe that wasn't a natural clip from the movie. <laughs> He's trying to prove it too much, Olivia. That's very good. Yes, you're absolutely right. He's protesting too much, isn't he, Cassio? Absolutely. Uh, wax shape looks like a wedding ring. Oh. And maybe I'm going to get a dog. And uh, Olivia has the last comment with, nope. But I have to refresh because I know it's really annoying when people find out that there are these comments, get to my Facebook page and I go, right, I want to see you later, bye, click. So I'm just going to see if anyone has written anything else. Um, no, brilliant. I have read all my comments. That's nice. Bella saying happy birthday to Amelia. That's lovely. Uh, right, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go and make a model of Shakespeare's Globe in uh, 23 minutes, reset story time, and I will see some of you in 23 minutes, have a screen break, yeah, just go look at the distance, stand outside, breathe in fresh air, have a cup of tea, I don't know, not a cup of tea, um, have a snack, and I will see you very soon, that's it really, thank you so much for all your support, <laughs> and I'll see you soon, bye!